we thank you for this morning that you've given to each one of us as we gather together as your church to honor and open up our hearts and praise and worship to the one God who has sent his one and beloved son to give up his life as an atoning sacrifice so that we might live he gave his life in order that we might have life in his name we pray that you draw near to us this morning continue to open up our hearts and minds to hear your word to hear your voice to hear your calling on our lives through it for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Please be seated. Good to see everybody this morning. Just a couple of announcements before we get back to our worship service. Um, if you're this is your first time with us, you'll see this connect card in front of you. If you wouldn't mind filling one out when we take up the offering, if you put it in there, it helps me. It's a blessing to me to remember uh, your name. And the, the church class is on that blessing for every card that gets turned in. The church donates five dollars to one of our local ministries here in town. So. Um, if you wouldn't mind, put one of those cards in our offering plate, and we pass that blessing on uh, to somebody else here in town who, who needs it. So this Friday, we've got our movie night coming up. Um, we pushed up the time, or back the time a little bit, to 845. We tested out the outside projector at home the other night. It doesn't show up quite that well until the until dusk, so 
That's going to be after 8.45, close to 9-ish before we hit play on that DVD player. We'll probably set the big screen out in the, the grass outside or maybe up front. We'll take a look around and see what's the best place. But um, we'll have that movie. It's a big screen. It's a 20-foot inflatable screen. So it's like sitting at a drive-in. So bring a lawn chair or blanket uh, to lay on the ground. Um, it's open for anybody. Invite anybody um, that, that would be interested in coming, just enjoying a, some popcorn, some drinks, some snacks, and we'll just sit down and... Uh, and enjoy a, a drive-in type of night uh, fellowship here at the church. So that'll be at 845. We'll be up here earlier to set up if anybody wants to show up earlier. The church will provide all the, the drinks and the snacks. We've got popcorn and, and all that goody stuff. So if you, that's, again, it's open to anybody. Um, invite whoever you'd like to come just to enjoy that, that evening with us. And to forget, don't forget, it's this, this Friday night. This morning, we're going to have our uh, come to the Lord's table in, in communion. And then afterwards, we have a time of fellowship. As you can smell the aroma coming from the back there, it's uh, fortuitous. This morning, as we look at the Beatitudes, those who hunger and thirst, <laughs> but it's for righteousness in Scripture. And if some of you come hungering and thirsting for the tacos bar that we're going to have um, after service. So we, there's plenty of food. We invite everybody to stay for a time of fellowship uh, with us after the service. We're going to... Um, have a time of fellowship, get to know one another, and we've got plenty of food um, to eat back there. But we're going to come to the Lord's table this morning as well. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians, and in chapter 11, as Paul writes to the church in Corinth, there in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Paul, as he writes to the church here, he's not giving what he had heard from other people. He's not saying, I read the gospel of Matthew and this is kind of what they did. It sounds like a good idea for you guys to do. This wasn't hearsay. Paul says there in verse 23, this is something I have received directly from the Lord. The risen Christ has revealed this to me. What took place on that last night when he was betrayed? That he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When we come to the table and we partake of the bread, it's done in remembrance that Christ gave his body. He was beaten and battered and bruised and eventually drug up on a hill and nailed to a tree in order that we might have life in his name. That body was given for us. Christ says, come to the table and take this bread. And when you do that, remember what I have given for you. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. All throughout scripture, the blood is described as our life. Christ gave up his life upon the cross. He shed his blood as an atonement for our sins to cover us, that we might be reconciled back to the Father. Jesus says, as often as you come together, take this cup and remember the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross in order to cover your sins, that you might stand before the holy presence of our heavenly Father. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. No other religion does this. No other religion proclaims their leader's death. We come and proclaim it in joyous fashion because it's his death that has given us life. We proclaim it. We shout it. Paul says, if I know anything, if I can't remember any piece of scripture, this I do know. I know Jesus Christ and him crucified, among all other things. 
my Lord and my God gave up his life, his body, up upon that cross in order to take my sins upon himself so I might have life in his name. We proclaim it. Paul says, this is what the Lord has delivered to me and now I deliver it to you as the church. That when you come together, as often as you do it, proclaim his death until he come. Because we know that when he comes, that when we have our name written in that book of life, if you've surrendered your life to him, then John tells us in 1 John that we become, we'll see Jesus for who he is, for who he truly is, and we will be just like him. That's why we proclaim it. That's why we take joy in coming to the table in remembrance of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Now we observe open communion. That doesn't mean anybody can take it. What it does mean is that you do not need to be a member of this church in order to come and partake in communion. But you do need to be a saved, born again, and baptized Christian. Otherwise, you're not proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. That's the instructions that we have here. If you've never given your life to Christ, then you're not proclaiming his death because his death means nothing to you. You must be born again. You must have surrendered your life to him. You must have been united with him in his own death and resurrection so that you can come and proclaim his death until he comes. So we welcome anybody who has been born again and who has been baptized to come and partake of the Lord's table this morning. We'll have a few minutes. There'll be some music in the background. Feel free to come up. Um, we have the prepackaged communion uh, cups here. Feel free to come and get one and return to your seats as we have a, a few minutes to reflect on what Christ has done for us personally at this time.
there, the song underneath it was black. So I thought it was removed. Uh, <laughs> I saw it, but I didn't put that overlap the song on top of the song. Yeah. <laughs> so he's going to have to take it off, remove it. Yeah, yeah you just flip it and then. <laughs> I don't know. Here we go. That's why Mary can be so smart. <laughs> that was on me.
you have your Bible, be in Matthew 5 and verse 6. We have a couple other verses to look in Matthew before we get there. I forgot I had left my Bible up here. So right before I came and looked next to me to grab my Bible and it wasn't there, you have that moment of panic as a pastor. is like, I forgot my Bible or it's missing. So we've been going through the Beatitudes as we come to verse 6 today. What does it mean to be hungry or thirsty? To be hungry or thirsty, it's a natural response for us as humans. We cannot go years or months or even weeks without food or water. It's only a matter of days before these bodies will die without eating or drinking. They need this nourishment or they will perish. There's nothing more real in this world than hunger and thirst. This natural desire to satisfy this need, it's ingrained into each and every one of us. It's for our survival. It's necessary. If someone hasn't eaten in two days, you don't have to tell them that they're hungry. They know they're hungry because they can feel the pains of hunger in them. If someone goes a couple of days without water, you don't have to tell them that they're thirsty. Their parts, lips, and their dry throat and their famished bodies know that they are thirsty. In our humanity, it's natural for us to know that we need food and water to live. Without these essentials, we will wither and die. This is the state of every natural man. Now, if we take this premise from our natural state and then move it over to our spiritual state, we have an understanding of what's being talked about this morning. A person who's been born again with that regenerate spirit does not need to be told to desire holiness. A born-again Christian who has been indwelled with the Holy Spirit does not need to be told to desire and pursue righteousness. Just like a natural man who does not need to be told they're hungry and thirsty, a spiritual man doesn't need to be told that they're hungry or thirsty either. They crave to be fed and nourished with things of the kingdom. They cannot go years or months or weeks either. They too will feel as though their bodies are perishing in just a matter of days without this constant nourishment that we get from God and his word. It's like food and water. It's necessary. We must have it. Jesus told a couple of parables along these lines in Matthew chapter 13. I think we have them. There in verse 44 is the first one. These parables of the kingdom. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And then in verses 45 and 46, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now this is not to suggest that the kingdom of heaven is for sale or that you can buy your way in. What Jesus is speaking about here is similar to what our beatitude is this morning. When a person comes across the kingdom, when they finally find it, they will do anything they can to have it. They will sell off everything for that one pearl because they know the great importance of it. This life, no matter, matters to them. The things in this life, the material items that we possess are gone. We have no use, no more need for them. We would sell them all in a heartbeat just to possess that pearl. We hunger and thirst so much for it. 
that we would do anything in order to possess it. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. What is it to hunger and thirst? We've already seen in a matter of speaking. As we've looked at each one of these Beatitudes, Spurgeon rightfully suggests that each one of these Beatitudes rises above one it proceeds. It's a continuous climb up this ladder. One cannot climb on this rung of the fourth Beatitude without stepping on the first three first. Unless you're poor in spirit, if you're mournful and repentive over your sins, unless you're meek, as you humbled yourself before God, you'll never know what it's like to hunger and thirst for righteousness. The meek man does not have aspirations for everything under the sun. He's no longer hungry for what the world can feed him. No, he hungers and thirsts for a kingdom that's far better than this one. In the next chapter, as we go through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, in Matthew 6 there, in verses 19 through 24, Jesus speaks about the kingdom. There in the beginning of verse 19, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, not this kingdom. Don't set your eyes upon this kingdom, but upon the next one. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your heart cannot be in two different places at one time. It's often been said, you know, show me your bank account for the last three months and I'll tell you where your heart is. What are your desires, your pursuits in life, the things that you spend your time on, the gifts that God has given you, your resources, your wealth. What does it go to? And that'll show you where your heart is because that's the thing that you treasure most. Jesus says, quit worrying about all the things in this lifetime building up all the possessions that we can because we can't take them with us. Instead, lay up for our treasures in the next kingdom. This is what we've seen in Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter says those things are imperishable, unfading, waiting in heaven. God is waiting to give them to us because they last forever. And then down in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Right? The Greek word mammon there. Money, possessions, wealth. You can't serve both. We often like to convince ourselves that one thing doesn't have to do with the other, that we can continue to compile these things in our life and pursue these things because we have to. We have families to feed and things to provide. We convince ourselves that one thing has nothing to do nothing with the other. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. He doesn't say these things are a little bit black and white. They get a little blurry here. No. You either have one or you have the other. If you are a slave, you cannot belong to two different masters. That doesn't make any sense. You're a slave to one and one only. Either to him or to the world. You either hunger and thirst after the pursuits of this world, or you hunger and thirst for his kingdom. And if your heart is in that place, then that's where your treasure will lie, and that's where life will take you. There are plenty of examples in Scripture of those who hungered after the wrong things. Nebuchadnezzar, self-absorbed, 
Look at all the things that I have done. The kingdom I have built. All this wealth that I have amassed for myself. The rich young ruler. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, go and sell all that you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. Sell everything and come purchase this pearl that I possess. But the young man goes away sad because he had much possessions. That's where his heart lies. If he would have known the worth and the value of that pearl, he wouldn't have hesitated to go and sell everything. But that's where his heart lies. That was his treasure. The treasure that Jesus possessed in his hand that he was willing to give wasn't worth all that he had for himself. Peter gives us a couple of illustrations in 2 Peter in chapter 2. Not pleasant ones either. Kind of crude, actually. In 2 Peter chapter 2, all of chapter 2 there deals with false prophets and false preachers, teachers, some of which were a part of the church at one time, but they've fallen away. And we'll pick up there in verse 20. Peter says, For after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. They've one, at one time in their life escaped <clears throat> the defilements of the world. They've turned from the world, turned from their sin. They've come into the church and they've heard the word. But then they slipped right back in again and tangled themselves and at once found themselves once again overcome by sin. Peter says as a warning, they're in a worse condition now than they were to begin with. Because before they had knowledge, it says there, it doesn't, when it says there, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that they had faith or saving faith, they just had intellectual knowledge. And I think that's the state of many people today who claim themselves to be Christians. They have an intellectual knowledge of who God is and who Christ is, but they've never surrendered their life to Him. Just because you know who God is and who Jesus is and what he's done does not mean that you're saved. Peter says these people had a knowledge. They heard of what God has done for them, that he had given up his son. Yet still, they turned their back and went back to sin, to their former life. Verse 21, it would have been better for them if they've never known the way of righteousness than after knowing it, turning back from the holy commandment delivered to them. It would have been better to them if they just never even knew the Bible to begin with because now they have zero excuse because they've heard the gospel and they've rejected it on their own accord. And then we get to verse 22, kind of the crude illustration that Peter gives what the proverb says has happened to them, the dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, or pig, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. So he gives these two examples, these two illustrations. The dog returns to its vomit. We've all either owned a dog or seen a dog, and we've seen some of the disgusting things that they will eat and lick up off the ground. We have a little dog that we let run loose to go outside in the bathroom. You'll run into the trees and you can't get him out. When you go find him, he's eating some disgusting corpse of leftover something. Doesn't he know that I've just bought this $70 bag of delicious dog food that I've spent all this money on? This great thing over here, but yet he'd rather eat and lick up this disgusting thing over there. It's because it's their nature. It's in their nature to go find out and eat it. He doesn't know any better that there's something better over here. The same as the pig. You can take it out and wash up, 
right? We have a similar saying in our own vernacular. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. What Peter is saying here. You can take the pig out and scrub it clean and dress it all up and make it look good. But as soon as you turn your back, that pig is right back into the muck and into the mud and into the mire. Because that's their natural state. It's in their nature to do it. A person will always return back to their natural state. Like the people described in 2 Peter 2. Regardless if they were teachers or preachers once before, they had never come to that saving grace in their life. So they returned back to the life of sin. An unrepented, ungenerated person will always return back to the entanglements and the sins of the world. It's not until you surrender your life to Christ that he saves you from them. And intellectual knowledge gets you nowhere except in bigger trouble than you were in the first place, as Peter describes, because now you know the truth and you've decided to reject it in your own heart and mind. In the end, a person will always show their true colors. In the end, they will always return back to what's natural for them, and that's sin, until you've been rescued from it. The natural man will return and entangle themselves with the things of this world. Just as the dog returns to the vomit, just as the pig returns to the mud. But the poor in spirit, the mournful, the meek, they hunger for righteousness. The vomit, the muck, and the mire are no longer desirable to them. As a matter of fact, it's repulsive to think of such things. Their natural state is now spiritual. That's what they hunger and thirst for. Nothing else can satisfy their craving for this kingdom of righteousness. They've been in the world already. They've been entangled and defiled by it. They know that there's nothing that this world can offer them that can ever fulfill this hunger and thirst that they have. Our physical life depends on food and water, but our spiritual life depends on holiness and righteousness. We want to be holy just as our Father in heaven is holy. That's what we return back to. Sin always drives us back to him, not back to the entanglements and defilements of the world. When you've been saved, you don't get driven back into the world you get bit driven back to the cross to where that sin was nailed and you mourn for it and you repent over it and you hunger and you thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst not to get too deep in the weeds on Greek grammar, but this is something that needs to be pointed out. In normal usage of the word, when we talk about hunger and thirst, it's written in what's called the genitive case in the Greek language. In that case, it expresses the proposition of in English. It would be like me saying, if I were, when we're eating, if I said, pass me the bread, most people would think that I'm not talking about all the bread on the table or all the bread in the house or all the bread in the world, that I just went some of the bread. That's the genitive case, and that's how it would normally be written. But in this case, it's not. That's not how it's expressed here. Here it's in the accusative case. And what Christ is intending here is that the person does not hunger for a piece or just a little bit or a portion of righteousness. No, they want it all. So that would be like me at the table saying, pass the bread, then you would understand that I mean, give me all the bread at the table. Give me all the bread that you have in this house. Go out into the world and bring me all of the bread. That's what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness. We want all of it. 
the righteousness that's identical to God's righteousness. Most people have a desire for some righteousness. There's honor among thieves, I'm told. But that's not what's being taught here. Not some degree, not a little bit, all of it. Hunger and thirst for all righteousness. And that's the righteousness that we can only receive from Christ. He who knew no sin became sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's only through him that we receive this righteousness. We cannot receive it on our own. You cannot come to God with a little bit of righteousness or a piece of righteousness that will do no good. When you stand before God, you must be covered in full righteousness, Christ's righteousness. Some will not do. You must desire righteousness in the same manner a starving man desires food and water. You must want it that desperately in order to be filled. Darby, in his comments on this verse, says to be hungry is not enough. I must be really starving to know what's in God's heart toward me. When the prodigal son was hungry, he went to feed on the husks. But when he was starving, he went to the father. That's the kind of desperation that only God can satisfy. Not just any righteousness. There again in the Greek language, the word righteousness is preceded by the definite article, the. So it's not just a hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's the righteousness. The righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of the kingdom of heaven. Again in Matthew 6. In verse 33, after Jesus has already said many of these things, but first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This is after he's talked about laying up treasures in heaven, not to be anxious. He teaches us the Lord's Prayer, how to love our enemies, how not to retaliate, anger, lust, how to be salt and light, how to be poor in spirit. Jesus is asking or commanding us to be this way. As his children, these are the attributes that we must take upon ourselves. So we ask ourselves, how? How can I do these things? How can I not be anxious? How do I know what it's like to be salt? and light. How can I control my anger? How do I get over this problem with lust? How can I be poor in spirit? Teach me how to mourn. Teach me how to pray. How can I be all these things that you've commanded me to be to love my enemies? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you. That's where you must go first. Because more often than not, we turn to self first. What can I do to get rid of my anger? How can I control this lust that continually pops up in my brain? How can I not hate these people that have wronged me so much? How do I not retaliate from those who've done me wrong? No, it's not I, I, me, me, us, we. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then these things will be added to you. We must come to him first. We can't know or understand what it means to be righteous if we don't have an understanding of God's righteousness that's written on every page of this book. We must know him. We must know his kingdom. We must know his righteousness before we could ever obtain it for ourselves.
We don't live on bread alone, as Jesus says, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Not some of the words, not the ones that I like, the ones that I agree with, on every word written in this inerrant Bible that's been given to us regardless of what your opinion is on it, regardless of what your lifestyle is, or the lifestyle of the people that you love most dearly in this life. It doesn't say, there's no if, ands, or buts in any of these words. His word is what we hang on. Every word that proceeds from his mouth in order to hunger and thirst for righteousness, we must first know him and his righteousness. Jesus says to seek that kingdom first. In John chapter 6, pop quiz, we went through John here recently, see who remembers. In John 6, verse 35, Jesus says to the crowd, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. When we come to him, poor in spirit and mournful are our sins, and surrender and subject our own lives to him, when we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we will be satisfied, Jesus says, because he's the bread. We'll never hunger and thirst again when we partake of him. Seek first him, his kingdom, his righteousness. We will be satisfied. And again in John chapter 4, when he's speaking with the Samaritan woman at the well, there in verse 10, Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God, the gift of eternal life, this pearl, if you knew about this pearl that I hold in my hand, and if you knew who it was that saying this to you to give me a drink, then you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And then down in 13, Jesus said to everyone who drinks this water, he's speaking of the well water, just any old run of the mill cup of the water, you're going to be thirsty again. No matter how much water you drink, you're still going to be thirsty. But whoever drinks of the water that I'll give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will be in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. When we seek him first and his righteousness, when we hunger and thirst for what he has, he satisfies us. We are filled full to the rim. We no longer hunger and thirst after the things of this life. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied or feel full, depending on your translation, a satisfaction that can only come from God. Charles Spurgeon says, a man desires meat, he eats it. He's filled for a little while, but he's soon hungry again. A man desires drink, and he has it, but is soon thirsty again. But a man who hungers and thirsts for righteousness will be so filled that he'll never again thirst as he thirsted before. <coughs> no one who was ever spiritually dead ever hungered for righteousness. That's why you must be poor in spirit, mournful of your sin, and meek. You must first climb on the first three rungs of the ladder of the Beatitudes before you reach the fourth. God has so made man's heart that nothing can ever fill it except for God himself. As the psalmist teaches us in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As a deer pants for flowing streams, 
So pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Whom shall I come and appear before God? His heart and his soul, everything about him, his being, hungers and thirsts for God and what he has and what he can give. Nothing else will do. And again in Psalm 63, verse 1. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Hungers and thirsts for righteousness. For God to be in his presence. Nothing else can satisfy. Nothing else can fill. But you must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. If you've ever stepped your feet upon those first three rungs of these Beatitudes, then no one needs to tell you that you're hungry. No one needs to tell a starving man that he needs food. No one has to tell someone who's poor in spirit, who mourns over their sin and humbles themselves before God, that they hunger and thirst for righteousness. Just as a hunger, natural man hungers for food, the spiritual man hungers for righteousness. If theirs and theirs alone is the kingdom of heaven, then nothing else can satisfy them. If they can never be filled until God gives them what only God can give them. And when they find that kingdom, they go and sell everything that they have in order to have that pearl. And it's only then that anyone can ever be truly satisfied. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had this morning. We pray that you continue to walk this path with us. We know that without you, it's impossible to be any of these things, let alone just one. To be poor in spirit, to be broken, to be mournful over our transgressions against you, to be humble and gracious, to hunger and thirst for what only you have, to be the salt, to be the light, to overcome all these things in our lives. It's only done when we seek you first in your righteousness. Open up our hearts and minds that we might know it and hear it and receive it. We pray that if there's anyone here today who's never truly given their lives to you, that today will be the day of their restoration, the day that they've been saved. Not only the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but his saving grace that only he can give. Father, we praise you and we thank you for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, I pray that today is that day for you. As we continue to go through the Beatitudes, you see these things are impossible for us to achieve on our own understanding. To be poor in spirit, to be so completely broken and emptied of self that we come to God with nothing but the sin that we're drenched in, that we born for it, that he might forgive us of them, that we become meek. And as we learn today, if you are all of those things, then no one needs to tell you that you're hungry. That's the whole point of the Jesus is getting across here. You don't have to tell somebody who hasn't eaten in three days that they're hungry. They know it. 
If you surrendered your life to Christ and you are poor in spirit and mournful over your wretched sin, that you've become meek and humble, no one needs to tell you that you hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's a natural desire in your spiritual state. And we can't achieve it or walk through life through it unless we first seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And then these things are added to us. If you have any questions about what we talked about today or about salvation or baptism, I'm happy to speak with you. After the service, we've got plenty of food. We welcome and invite everyone to stay with us and eat and, and fellowship with us. Again, if you have any questions, you can come speak to me during this time. I'd like everybody to please stand. We're going to worship through song one more time, and we'll see you back here next week. <laughs>